Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 441, featuring part 3 of my interview with Annie Vandermeer. This part of the interview, we get into the, her work on the uh, Neverwinter Nights series, uh, specifically Neverwinter Nights 2 and the expansions. Uh, she does a lot, uh, talks a lot about her work on the items for those games. Uh, then we get into Alpha Protocol, what was going on behind the scenes of that espionage RPG. Uh, then we talk about voice acting, what it's like to uh, write for voice actors, what it's like to work with them and uh, to do them, <laughs> or, to, or to be a voice actor. She even gives us some samples of her own uh, voice work. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Annie Vandermeer. There's, there's a term called friendie. <laughs> friendie. <laughs> Yeah, I'm casually thrown around where it's like, well, you're in the industry, so you know to not, you know, post about this on, on Polygon or something like this. You know to not tell people outside of stuff. Um, and in some, I think it depends on the, the development environment. Like in Southern California, in, in Orange County, it was a little more guarded on stuff. But up in Seattle, everybody's like, oh, no, I know you're at 343. I can guess what you're working on. Um, <laughs> Like, sometimes That's you just cool. know. Um, I had friends at uh, Hardsuit before uh, Bloodlines 2 got announced that they genuinely couldn't talk about it. And I think other developers were like, what? Like, you can't even friend EA me on this? Like, nobody. I cannot. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, in those situations, uh, like, it's tough. And, I, I mean... They're, I think companies are also trying to lock down a little bit more because when I was at Bungie, they're like, don't take pictures uh, in the office because one time somebody took a picture of a Master Chief or Master Chief's helmet and a fan looked at the reflection in the helmet with somebody's screen and like figured out what, what? was there. Yeah, oh, people man. are determined and resourceful. <laughs> so, I mean, somebody's mom says something on social media without like really meaning to and stuff can get spoiled. So I think that in in developer only kind of quarters, it's like, yeah, we can usually we can we talk about stuff. But with anybody else it's like, no, we probably shouldn't. And like companies are being like, do don't <laughs> so, well, so I mean really just... it sounds like the big fear is not well they're gonna learn how to do this technique. But more like this is this is some kind of a secret part of the story or some part of the oh, character it's... i mean what are they afraid what what, is, what are they so afraid of is going to happen if this leaks out uh i think a lot of times like some i think the biggest one is just we are working on this ip or it has this sort of thing like uh you know that that can make a difference uh to like oh crap this company's working on this thing like if it's a large enough company it's like another uh, if a publisher hears they may like you know, try to find somebody else to make a competing project. Um, developers don't necessarily work that way. Publishers, I'm sure they do. Not to like shade on publishers. It's, it's a business and they, they, they got to run it well. Um, and I think it's another thing too, where it's like, I don't know, sc scuttlebutt about a project not working well or working well might also be a sort of situation where it's like, oh, there may be some disaffected people there. <laughs> Maybe we should like, seek some people out and see if we could do any like poaching. Ah. I think most places don't do poaching, but it can happen. It does happen. Um, or like even just like reaching out to people. It's a sort of thing where it's just like, um, if you have an IP or if you have a sort of project, like there, there seems to be a sort of vested interest in like not letting all the specifics get out. They're like controlling the narrative. So I can understand that, but at the same time, uh, when you work on something cool and you really want to tell somebody, like, yeah, uh, it's so difficult. <laughs> yeah, this might explain some of what we were talking about before, but just the people not knowing the folks because of all this need for secrecy all the time, right? And not oh, being able okay. to talk about, <laughs> like, well, we just had, we can't talk about this wonderful, amazing thing. Yeah, it's a sort of situation where I think I've seen a couple places, um, honestly, most notably System Error, con controlling the narrative in that they... Um, I mean, they did the the vlog where they'd actually do some shots around the office and like go up and and talk to you about a feature that was coming up. And it was the sort of situation where it was like those happened when the feature was kind of largely in the bag. So it wasn't a sort of situation where players are like, well, what's what's happening with that? Um, 
And I mean, that can happen too. If you, if the general public knew how much stuff might get into the game or, or, you know, got caught or whatever, it's a, it's a harder thing to sort of understand to be like, well, what you had this thing it was in the game. Like, yeah, but it wasn't fun. It was a stretch goal. <laughs> Damn it. Yeah. That was a stretch goal. Yeah. Sometimes stuff just doesn't work out and it's, it's a harder thing to try to, to work through and explain, mm-hmm. um, where it's like, yeah, it's it gets into a whole bunch of tangled stuff. So so having a situation where you control the narrative, I mean, I get it makes a lot of sense. And it's also getting people excited about the right things instead of like, well, why don't you have this thing? Like, well, but look at this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, let's move on then to a game that gets a lot of love around <laughs> uh, Match yet. That's a Neverwinter Nights 2. <laughs> you know, I was looking at you know, some of the stuff you had worked on. You worked on the project, right? I was trying to get into some of the, maybe some of the specific things. Mm-hmm. I saw listed there on, uh, I think this is Wikipedia, the uh, the items. Yep. And then also, I guess you were you were sort of marketing the game or talking about it at conventions. I'm not quite sure what what was going on. Uh, but yeah, I'd like to know more about, like, what, what were you doing on the game? And looking back on it, what are your thoughts? Absolutely. I mean, uh, so the... When uh, when Dwarfs was canceled, there was a sort of like reorg, um, and for Neverwinter two, it had all of the items from the previous games, and that was I think over three thousand. Three thousand. It, it was ridiculous. I'm probably overinflating that, but it was just, and I think the technical term is a crap ton, uh, and the. Um, it was a sort of situation where, like, the the artists were super swamped, and it was all... I think that stuff initially had been sort of thought of as, like, this will be fairly easy the way we structure this for players to put together, because it was also... The editor was getting built at the same time that was meant to be, you know, external sort of thing. So it was like trying to drive a car that was getting put together <laughs> as you were going. But I got in a situation where... I got put in charge of all the items to decide all of the, like they were, their, their properties and stuff had largely been set. Their names had been set. Um, but the, choosing the right model for them, dyeing it, um, choosing the right icon, making sure that they worked, working with the, the uh, people who handled the specific acts and modules about what was going to go where, um, there was a there's a lot of stuff to place so that the game as you know is just kind of like Monty Hall there's so many things in it uh so yeah how everything looked uh that was down to me so if something looks particularly atrocious sorry <laughs> it was hard to make the rainbow armor look good <laughs> another funny thing about that is at the time Wizards of the Coast was like asymmetry asymmetry everything has to be asymmetrical and a lot of the armor sets were not built for that so i i would like contribute something and the coordinator or the liaison from wizards of the coast would be like no change those pauldrons so i'd have to make one little smaller put spikes on it or something like that just gotta change that it has to go down to that level of yeah it's like changing the pauldrons the pauldrons it was one that stood out the most as as world of warcraft can tell you big stuff on the shoulders real stands out but um, in terms of the marketing, um, PAX had just started to be a thing, uh, the Penny Arcade Expo, and there was only the one. It hadn't split into a million yet. And um, uh, and I was a, am a huge Penny Arcade fan, and I was like, we should go, we should go. This is going to be a big opportunity. We should show the game there. And that was very last minute. It was like two or three weeks before PAX is like, okay, you're going and you're showing the game. Like, yay. Also, ah, um, but they were very kind to accommodate us. Like last minute, they gave us, um, this big stage to show things off. And, um, it was also, it was less sure. Like, I think it was just two days at the time. So it was two, two booth days, me basically by myself, uh, showing the game and it was stressful, but a lot of fun. Was that the first time you'd done something like that? Or? Oh, and I'd shown Taxi Driver at E3 2005 for an hour. 
like just over an hour and I was thousand yards staring at there. But like, I think it was a big, just like, Oh God, so much. E3 is such incredible sensory overload. Um, And I appreciate so much that PAX took, has taken so many pains to like moderate that as, as, as well as they can. Um, And especially then it was a lot smaller of a show. But yeah, that was for for two full days. Yeah, that was definitely the first thing I'd ever done anything like that. And I really loved it. I thought it was fun as hell. So, I mean, I was very, very fortunate that I got a chance to do that. That they're like, yeah, okay, this junior designer keeps going on about PAX, so let her go. (laughs) Get some people up there. Well, I had George on, George Zeitz. And he was, of Mm -hmm. course, talking about Mask of the Betrayer. So before we get into uh, Storm, I thought, you know, I'd like to get your thoughts on, on that. You know, I've often heard it described as maybe the best narrative in a CRPGs period, but, you know, certainly one of the best expansions mm-hmm. ever released. And, of course, you're somebody who helped design that. You know, so, so what are your thoughts on, on how that came together? Um, I, Well, the funny thing is, technically speaking, my, my quote, full-time role at that point was on Alpha Protocol. And Kevin Saunders actually uh, took me out for coffee and was like, so can you make items for us? Because you're the item person at this point. Yeah. You know that tool set better than anybody. We don't have a huge team for this. Can you do this? And I was like, yes, yes, of course I can. Because they were also epic level items, which are ludicrous. And it was also a situation where um, part of the, the thing about those items is like, we want, these are not just epic in terms of, you know, it's plus 10 to damage. They need to have epic stories to them. These need to be meaningful uh, items. And so getting a chance to to do that, and that I was, you know, asked specifically to do that was so awesome, and I, I was so excited about it. So I would work uh, my full day on Alpha Protocol, and then for a couple hours, um, bring up four different PDFs about like, um, oh gosh, Thay and the Ilfarn Empire and legendary weapons and other things. I always had at least four up and like scooting through different ones, deities probably, um, to, to make these epic weapons and to make sure that they were things that fit well in the story. And, uh, George was so nice and like, let me, kind of go bonkers on stuff. George also, I did make a couple of, of items for, um, for Neverwinter 2 for the original campaign. And one of those was, was Finch's fine chapeau. Finch's and, fine chapeau. And so I had been talking to George about this idea I had for this bard Finch. And George was super into this character and was like, yeah, you should make more, more stuff from Finch. And I was like, don't mind if I do. Like, getting indulged on a, a, an OC of mine, like, oh boy. So, yeah, I'm, I definitely made more Finch stuff to the point where it was like, hell yeah, he's going to be a character and Storm is a here. He's just, he's a guy who loses things because he's like that friend you have that just, he keeps getting himself into trouble and you're like, buddy, why do you do this? But he's real fun to be around. Um, it's like a very stereotypical bard, but I, I loved Finch. Um so yeah, he let me he indulged me uh, on my love for making stuff that Finch left behind, uh, and also uh, got to make some uh, some items that I was genuinely really happy about and tell some sort of little mini stories. Um, Remember what I some also of those, gave... some of those items were? Oh uh, yeah, I I okay, I made one that was tied to my sort of theory about Easter eggs, which is it needs to be a good thing even if you don't get it. Um, and that was, uh, one of those was Faraneath's Redemption. And this is super obscure because Stephen Colbert once did an interview about his D&D days and he said that he played a paladin named Faraneath. Oh, and cool. That he had, like, gotten a belt of strength or something like that and, like, torn a guy apart cause, just because he could. And it was like, well, you're not a paladin anymore because you did something very not lawful good. And so I wanted to make a shout-out and an item that was like, and this is how he redeemed himself. Um, and uh, Matt McLean, another designer, 
like burst into my room after like a play, like a all company uh, play day, and was like, "Did you make this thing?" Because <laughs> he knew who Faranith <laughs> was, and I was like, "Yeah, it's like that's yeah. amazing." Um, yeah, I mean the that one was one that stood out to me. Uh, oh, <laughs> the best dagger in the game, Merstaba is um, was a shout out that I did that I hope knowing that it's a shout out does not diminish this at all uh, for Mr. Stabby, the actual knife that uh, <laughs> that pork fry has from uh, from Penny Arcade because when I was up there, uh, to show Neverwinter Nights 2, everything was a mess. I couldn't open any of the boxes, and I'd met him at E3, and he came over and helped me, and I was like, if you help me put this together, I'll put something in a game or something like that. Yeah. He's like, yeah, put my knife in the game. So that's Mr. Stabby, uh, this terrifyingly sharp, uh, maiming knife. <laughs> so, uh, and I like the idea, too. I had a, I have a soft spot for kobold, so having something be like, oh, yeah, it's, it's in Draconic. Like, it probably just means Mr. Stabby, but dang, danged if this isn't the most murderous <laughs> dagger ever. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot. He doesn't have a soft spot for kobolds. You know? <laughs> yeah, aw, oh, they're a little terrible. 11 days! Sorry, critical role fan. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I had a blast uh, coming up with with stuff for that, and I, I really enjoyed that game. Oh, <laughs> there's another thing I did for that game, which was I voiced... Two of one of many's uh, 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 personalities, I think. So yeah, that's me. I'm the hag and the child. And the uh, the day that I did those, um, all the water was broken <laughs> at Obsidian, and there wasn't any water bottles or anything. So I just rasped the hell out of my throat for the hag. Like, gotta go for it. And was just like, oh my god, the rest of the day, like, hunting for cough drops, like, wow. where is it? <laughs> so that was that was an amazing game to work on, and I think that it's part, a great example of my whole career, where it's like, if there's not a locked door keeping me from an aspect of development, I'm going to just go in there and mess with stuff. <laughs> like, you, you have to shove me out of development areas with a broom to be like, no, <laughs> like, okay, cool. Are you sure I can't? No, Annie, stay away from art. Like, all right, okay, sorry. I just, enthusiasm. <laughs> so let's back up a little bit. I think I jumped ahead a little bit by talking about a, a mask, but I didn't want to cover Alpha Protocol, at least if my phone will cooperate. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I remember I had Chris Avalon on the show, mm -hmm. and it's hard for me to believe that it was 10 years ago. <laughs> 2010. That's <laughs> like yesterday. Oh, uh, but anyway, he was just so psyched and pumped about this game. I mean, he the, the level of enthusiasm was contagious. And, <laughs> you know, I guess it just didn't quite work somehow. You know, I'm not I'm just kind of curious what your what your take is on that. What, well, what happened have, with it? I have a kind of interesting first, yeah. position on it because I played I was I was on the first iteration of it. It was a very, very different game. Um, when I was working on it, and I'm just going to be like, hey, NDA, um, it was a lot more Syriana, and then they decided they wanted it to be more like Kill Bill. Uh, like, a lot louder, a lot crazier, mm -hmm. um, and a lot more showy. Uh, and actually, a, a character that I'd, I'd done a decent amount of the writing on it by, like, you know, I, I wrote a whole character, I wrote the handler, um, and, uh, got to, uh, do some other, uh, stuff for it, but it was a sort of unfortunate situation that we were at like 90% script complete and 75% VO recording complete when it was just like, nope. And all of that got thrown out. So none of my writing exists in that game anymore. Um, and I don't think any of Brian Misoda's does either. Um, like maybe one scene, but what the hell the were they thinking? It was kind of crazy. It was a sort of situation where, and I've seen it sort of since when you have a studio want to try something that's one a hybrid. Hybrids are very hard to make, um, and even as much as I'm just like genre is a just construction. It is a 
combination of mechanics, some of which people really understand and some of which they don't. And like uh, a modern day setting is very difficult because people have very different expectations. I think it was a sort of situation where it was like, well, we were working with Unreal 3, which was still still new. And uh, so people had to get up to speed on a, uh, on a new engine pretty quickly. And, um, and yeah, I, I think that it was a sort of, it kind of had somewhat of a fraught development. People had very different expectations. Um, and there were some difficulties with communication, I think, between departments. Um, and yeah, I mean, I still got a lot of great experiences from writing that game. If nobody, will, nobody might see any of the, the writing that I've done for it, but I still, I still really enjoy it. And the time that I had working with, uh, with actors, with voice actors, was so much fun and pretty much absolutely cemented me as a complete VO fangirl. Like, lo- I love it so much. <laughs> love working with it. It's like all of the, the wannabe failed actress that I was through, through college and wanting to do, and it was like, well, that's not going to come together. It was just like coalesced into this is so much fun to work with them uh and to like they make my characters come to life uh sort of yes a favorite or... oh 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 man um i don't i don't even know if he's in the industry anymore but the guy who played um uh mike thornton uh josh gilman was so much fun to work with i loved that dude he was just like an, he always wanted to know like more about the game like the specifics of the scene uh it was so fun to to work with that guy and uh, just like, like hang out with us and chill um oh gosh uh why am i blanking on the guy who played oh jim jim cunningham i think the guy who played marburg He's super nice dude. The voice of Winnie the Pooh. The voice of, like, my childhood. Like, Darkwing Duck and everything. And he's playing a dude who stabs people in the neck with a pen. <laughs> that was that was pretty incredible. Because uh, nicest guy. And then he'd just go into that Marburg voice. And you'd just get, like, oh, the creepy chills. Like, oh, he's going to murder people. Uh, uh, Great Alisle. Great Alisle actually played the, the character. Jim that, Cummings uh, is his name. Uh, who? Jim Cummings. Yes. I know it's cool. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, um, Great allows an incredible actress and that she, uh, read anything that I ever wrote was amazing. Uh, Danica McKellar, who was Winnie from the Wonder Years, uh, actually was the first person cast as, as Mina Tang as the handler. And she gave me an Animaniac CD and that was amazing. Aww. Like there's so, I have I have so many stories of me just absolutely fangirling over these people who were like enormously talented and I'm the sort of person that when anybody else is playing a game I'm like that's Fred that's Mary that's just like name them like they're my friends like (laughs) yeah I'm an unabashed nerd about it and I think that for certain names if you mention them to anybody who's worked with actors like they get it like Fred Tattashore he's amazing (laughs) anybody will be like yeah these people these people um and it feels kind of like a fulfillment of like when i was a little like a young teenager and they were just starting to do vo for games and like some live action stuff Uh, (laughs) speaking of sierra right they just get people around the office to do all their their voices um, (laughs) it was a sort of situation where it was like this is cool that this exists and I feel like this is going to get better. I remember telling my dad, they're going to have real actors do this sometime, like real good ones. And he was doubtful, but I, again, was proven right <laughs> when it came to games. But, uh, but yeah, I, it was, it was fantastic. It was, but returning to the whole like table flip on the game kind of situation, there were some turnovers in the team and I was brought over to, uh, to write on and do stuff for a storm was a here. So, uh, like that got changed over and uh, Avalon came on the project to fill in on the, the lead designer role. And it was just determined that it, a tone change was something that, that they desired. So it was like, it required that much of a flip. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it was a heartbreaker. Mm-hmm. I like, I, 
I won't lie that it was just like it's hard to think about that game after the fact when like a bunch of stuff has been lost but I know that it meant a lot to a lot of people who worked on it and some people a lot of fun on it so I can begrudge people no fun uh and uh you know I I, legit I will admit this I haven't played the game (laughs) it's so difficult it's like going back to an old relationship I can imagine yeah Oh, I don't. Kind of I don't even know what to like now. <laughs> I hit them up on Facebook once and felt weird about it. And... <laughs> well, you had talked. Not I don't, now that we're talking about voice actors, you we talked a little bit before about some of the the union aspect, like union versus non-union. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of curious about that. And was it Liam? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so let's uh, let's get into this. This sounds like fun. So. Uh... I think that I don't know if the first Neverwinter Nights two was was Union. I know that they used New York actors for that one, but for for Mask of the Betrayer, it was um, Womb doing it. Womb actually had done um, Vampire: The Masquerade, Bloodlines, and a bunch of other really incredible uh, games, and they had a fantastic cast for it. And it was that was a Union joint. And for non-Union stuff, you're not to the best of my knowledge, you don't uh, get credited in the same way. You kind of like, it's on on the down low kind of thing. Um, I think that the rules are probably very different now because there's been several strikes since then and the rules have been rewritten. Um, but at the time that I recall, um, it was a sort of more open kind of thing. Like you just wouldn't get necessarily credited if you were doing a non-union kind of thing. And it meant that like, if you're doing a union project, you can't have anybody non-union do VO. So that's why my voice for the hag and for, I think I did some of the enemy voices too. Yes, I did. Which was really interesting in like company all calls to like suddenly hear myself as an enemy casting a really wicked spell. I mean, be like, <laughs> dang me. I know what that is. That's wretched wilting or something. Um, uh, so yeah, that's, that is why oh, some I did weird legal issues around all. Yeah, this. there was there was no crediting me in that one, and there wasn't any, to the best of my knowledge, any credit list for Storm as a Hero because it was uh, a non-union thing. But it did mean that I got to do a full voice, several different voices in the game. Uh, one of which was one of the cohorts, Cheer Dark Flame, uh, which was a lot of fun and. I, try to go up here in her voice it's a little difficult if i don't really arch you know i have to prep for it my sort of like go-to voice to practice was gur from invader sam <laughs> be like i made it myself there we go that's high every single time i was like wow. my voice was dipping a bit when i was doing the lines uh i had to like jump back to doing gur quote and ah, i'd bring it up again uh because she's a psychotic gnome <laughs> so uh but yeah, uh, one of the people that we cast that was phenomenal that people might know is Liam O'Brien, uh, who's on Critical Role now, and I hear his voice all over the place. He's he's fantastic, and I had him do a cohort choral, which I was like, he's an emo drow, he's an emo half drow. Like I really want him to be super over dramatic, like just find where the top is and bust through. Like he is so full of himself he is taking everything to the limit uh and he just killed it and his sort of return lines were like my mom threw away my mascara and my favorite band is avengers (laughs) sevenfold so ludicrously funny guy a lot of fun to work with and the the sad thing with working on vo for storms here was everything was over skype so i didn't get to meet anybody uh, which was like i would have loved to meet these people but then he didn't, he wouldn't see all the fangirl like on my face. So that was maybe good. <laughs> um, and he had the best outtake I'd ever heard. Uh, there was one line, uh, characters would have like s- sort of uh, lines that they would say when they first entered a module area. And there was one for Crossroad Keep. And one of the things about Quarrel is he's obsessed with Amanjaro uh, from uh, the original campaign. Like he's his, his like warlock hero. So his line was, the master walked here. I can almost sense his footsteps. 
And Liam said, the master pooped here. I can almost <laughs> sense his skid marks. We lost our minds. And I don't think I did it, but some incredible person, probably the engineer, saved that sound clip. And I have carried it with me since. I still have it. And I was so proud that I got to play it for Liam O'Brien when he was at the Emerald City Comic Con this past year. And... He was enorm- like enormously charming about it. He was like, I think I remember like doing that. And I was like, ah, no, you don't. Do you? So, yeah. Ludicrous fangirl. I, I couldn't help it. <laughs> That's amazing to me how much you... you know, we don't normally think about voice acting as having that much impact on a game. But, I mean, so much more than what most people probably imagine. You're just, oh, here's some lines. Read the lines. Record them. <laughs> yeah. Not really realizing the full impact those uh, mm. actors make on the experience yeah it's the audition process is always kind of difficult because you have to go through often a lot of actors who are not reading your lines well <laughs> or they just swing for the fences and it's like wow I don't know where you came up with this. Like, we heard a text in Marburg that was like, well, Mark Thornton. It's like, well, okay. That's, that's, a, that's a take. Or a handler that was like, Thornton. So, like, super, no, please don't. Like, at one point, one of the auditions for Handler was so bad, I, like, screamed into a chair. <laughs> like, no, this isn't my, oh, my poor writing, torn to shreds, you know over dramatic but when you do find that right voice for a character and when i heard josh gilman's voice as as uh mike thornton i actually like got for reals goosebumps um when you find that voice and when you're working with that actor and so many are so dedicated to their craft it is i mean it's amazing always to work with somebody who is serious about what they do uh and is eager to understand context and collaborate with you on stuff and it's just having a good time like that's so much fun <laughs> it's so it's so great to do let's talk about storm of zay here am i saying that right by the way never quite it's sure it was zay here but <laughs> it's not well, let's talk about storm of Z- zay here <laughs> zay here <laughs> Uh, so I was reading about the, you know, some of the behind-the-scenes information about that game and the development process, and uh, they were saying the intention behind that was to create something more lighthearted, mm-hmm. I guess, than a Mask of the Betrayer, and a lot of cool features in there, like the party conversation system. And so I was, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, you know, sort of the intentions and why, you know, that that decision, and also mm-hmm. like to get into this party conversation system because that that's pretty cool. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back uh, next week with the fourth installment. Probably be at least uh, one, maybe two more installments with Annie. Uh, So stay tuned for that. Uh, As always, I want to thank you very, 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 very much for your support of Matt Chat, for keeping these episodes, for keeping these interviews coming. I would not do it. I could not do it uh, without your support and friendship. So it means so much to me, guys. I really appreciate your help with these uh, episodes. If you want to help and you haven't already done so, what the heck are you waiting for? Go on that link to that Patreon site and uh, sign up to be a member of the Rat Pack. And that will cost you a whopping one dollar per episode. <laughs> you know, no, I hope nobody's hurting that bad. Uh, that they can't afford that but uh, you know whatever it is you can afford you feel comfortable with i really appreciate that as well as the people who post about the show tweet about the show facebook about it instagram about it TikTok about it you know uh, <laughs> maybe even just like communicate about it with a friend using the vocal apparatus uh, that's all cool uh anyway what about that news from the matt case got quite a slew of news here 
at the Mac Cave. <laughs> at least uh, four items. Uh, first up, this is just kind of interesting. Uh, this is from VG247, Sheriff Saeed. Or Saeed, not quite sure how to pronounce his name. We'll go with Saeed. Uh, this Walson game I was talking about last time. Walson or Walson, Lords of Mayhem. Apparently that has turned out to be quite the hit game. Uh, so this article is about sort of how this came out of nowhere to dominate charts. A meteoric, 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 <laughs> not really, actually sure how to pronounce that word, meteor, uh, like a meteor. It rose on Steam charts uh, after leaving early access. So they talk a little bit about the stats here. Uh, up to 62,000 uh, concurrent players on this thing. And what's really interesting is that the reviews are quite mixed. It's like about 50-50. About half of them say this is what Diablo 3 should have been. Uh, others saying this is just an unpolished, buggy mess. Don't even bother. You know, usually when you have a situation like this, the truth is somewhere in the middle, uh, I find. So I'm just going to hold off, probably uh, see if they can patch some of these uh, bugs. And then I'll come back and maybe see if it's something... Uh, you know, worth looking at, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. You know, I I've talked about it before, uh, but, you know, if you're playing it, I'd like to hear your opinion on that. Uh, second news item is if you've been watching a show called Altered Carbon, I don't remember when that came out, it seems about a, <laughs> at least a couple years ago, uh, a big hit on Netflix is the cyberpunk, they call it a neo-noir uh, cyberpunk series. Well, there's an official tabletop RPG based on that now. Uh, based on the series as well as a novel. I wonder which one came first now that I'm <laughs> wondering. Uh, anyway, it's a Kickstarter. They got it's a tabletop RPG, I should say. Uh, they got over two weeks left on the Kickstarter. They were asking for a paltry 20,000, and they are now up to 230,000. Whoa, 1,000% 1, funded. I mean, that is amazing. Uh, they are, are working with the creators of the show, is my understanding. Uh, and they've got some experience doing tabletop games. Let's see, what's the name of this company? Hunter's Books is the name of the uh, studio. And what I was, I was looking for what might be cool about it, uh, other than the licensing tie-in, of course, and they say that they've done some work with Character Death. So they say, uh, whereas Character Death is a natural occurrence in tabletop RPGs, Altered Carbon, the role-playing game, offers a unique angle on the concept. As opposed to creating a brand new character, players will have the opportunity to transfer their character's consciousness, memories, and experiences into new, into new sleeves post-death, but at a cost. Now, that sounds like a pretty fun mechanic. You know, it'd be fun to see uh, what happens there. Uh, but anyway, that is Altered Carbon, the role-playing game. And then when I was over there looking at that game, I came across two other Kickstarters, for this time for uh, computer RPGs, I wanted to mention. One is uh, Kindred Fates. This is an open-world monster-battling RPG. Uh, so they, I've seen it described as a combination of the uh, Pokemon series with uh, Breath of Wild, Breath of the Wild. Uh, capture monsters, explore a dark and unforgiving region, fight to take back your home. Uh, so they were asking for 50k, and they went to also went over 200k. I guess there's like big times for Kickstarters right now. Uh, a little uh, over a week left on this one is by Sky Mill Studios. They're calling it a love letter to the monster battle genre, but they want to evolve the genre and bring uh, fans what they've been asking for: thought-provoking storytelling, antagonists with a sympathetic cause, compelling character development, morally ambiguous decisions and living with the consequences of your actions, all that for 30 bucks for the digital copy, I should say. And then lastly, we have uh, what I think is probably the coolest of the bunch here. This is Cyber Knights, a cyberpunk RPG. You know, we seem to be getting a lot of the cyberpunk stuff lately. Uh, but this one does indeed look quite cool. It's a tactical RPG. You know, just looking at it, I thought this was uh, some kind of XCOM uh, game, but uh, in this one you're leading a team of hackers, mercs, and thieves into the neon-soaked future of 2020-31. So this is a couple of brothers doing this. The uh, Tress, or Trees brothers, T-R-E-S-E, -E, Corey and Andrew. Uh, so Corey and Andrew say they grew up playing uh, paper RBGs, and uh, that's what led them uh, to this game. So this will be a turn-based squad tactics RPG for PC as well as the other systems there. Let's see what else I want to say about that. Jack in, explore a unique cyberpunk world. So it sounds like they're doing their own 
uh, game world, so that's kind of nice not to pay royalties for the license. Let's see, here we go. Uh, tactical combat in this game is inspired by classic turn-based games. Every member of your customized squad and each enemy unit brings their own special abilities, tricked out weapons, and ammo loadout to the fight. Depending on the mission, you'll pick up to six specialists from your team of hired mercs. Based on their mix of jobs, talents, implants, and customized weapons, you'll find ways to outmaneuver and outgun the enemy to complete the mission. Uh, so this kind of sounds to me like a little bit of Syndicate, if you remember that from back in the day. Uh, of course, the uh, Shadow Run series with a little bit maybe of an XCOM flavor. Anyway, it looks really good. You know, who who knows how it will turn out, but it got my <laughs> it piqued my curiosity enough to uh, pledge, and it's forty bucks to get the digital copy on that. Uh, whew, all right, uh, let's wrap it up with a quote. And I was looking uh, for quotes since Annie was talking so much about voice acting and how much fun that is, and how she likes the voice actors. I was uh, trying to find some quotes by voice actors, and I came across one I really liked by. Anthony Daniels, and I think he was a voice actor in some kind of sci-fi movie, wasn't really very popular, uh, kind of uh, obscure. Uh, but anyway, the quote is good. Uh, it goes something like this. <laughs> we have people being a little uncomfortable in their life on Earth with their finances and so on. So science fantasy or science fiction allows people to think that there are possibilities beyond the gravity of our planet. Ponder on that, and see you guys next time. Much easier. What makes